Hello everyone, it's me, Dave Tong, come to join you again in the Storytelling Circle at the World Storytelling Cafe. Here I am again in my garden. The sun is sort of shining. The birds are singing noisily. Hold on to that thought, we'll come back to birds in a very short while. But for the moment, I'd like to say this. I have not come alone this day. I brought a very special guest, a very special friend with me. There she is, look just behind me. Lady Fortune. Some call her Dame Fortune. You can call her either. She'll answer to both. If you look close, you'll see that she's standing behind a great cartwheel that she's spinning around and around and around. Look closer still and you will see that many medieval folk cling to that wheel. For they believed long ago that we all clung to Dame Fortune's wheel, and sometimes we would rise upon that wheel, which meant that we were having good luck. But the wheel dictates for some of us to rise, others must be falling, they must be having bad luck. So it was, and so it perhaps still is. For certainly there are many, including myself, who feel like we really are falling upon Dame Fortune's wheel at the minute. But just remember, my friends, as the wheel keeps turning, many of us will rise again. A little bit of hope then, a chink of light in these dark times. Well, I brought my friend Dame Fortune with me this day because know this. She lurks unseen, not just in my stories, but in most of the stories you'll hear other tellers tell at the World Storytelling Cafe. For certainly most of my stories, they deal with the fortunes of some the misfortunes of others, and often they go hand in hand. Look closer still. You will see that she is blindfold. She cannot see all of those people clinging to her wheel. And so it is, she, she cares nothing for men's and women's estates and degrees. Posh and poor all could and did fall upon her wheel. Even medieval monarchs could fall long ago. I know this, my friends. Once a king lay dying, but his would not be an easy death, for the king had three sons, all with many faults and few merits, or so he thought. And so he could not decide who among them would become the next king when he was dead and gone. Such were his woes and worries, he could not decide, and so he summoned to him his wisest advisers, old men, sage old fellows, all with bent backs and beards so long that they dusted the floor as they walked along. The old king asked their help. They went away for three days to ponder upon the problem. And no, that's the best kind of thinking there is. And when at last they returned, they said, Sire, my lord, in order to know which of your three sons should be the next king when you are dead and gone, first you must know something of their natures. What makes them the way they are? And in order to know their natures today, you must ask them a question. This question. If you were a bird, what bird would you be? And why? Heeding the wise men's words, the old king sent for his first son, his eldest son, who was called Robert. And he said, Robert, Robert, my boy, if you were a bird, what bird would you be and why? That's easy, father, said Robert. If I were a bird, I would be a falcon, a hunting bird of prey. For that fierce bird, it sets its beady eye upon its prey, be it pigeon, duck, other bird or beast. It swoops and it does not stop until it's taken all that it wants. Just as a good king, he should not stop until he has taken all that he wants in this world. Now I wonder, who thinks that's a good answer? There's always one or two. Who thinks it's a bad one? But the king did not think. Instead, he summoned his second son, who was called William. William Rufus, meaning William the Red. For the lad was known for his fiery red hair and his fiery red temper. And he said, William, William, my boy, if you were a bird, what bird would you be? And why? Oh, that's easy, father, said the lad. If I were a bird, 
I would be an eagle, for the eagle is feared by all other birds. Just as a good king, he should be feared by all of his people. Well, who thinks that's a good answer? Not many, I think. Who thinks it's a bad one? The king did not think. Instead, he sent for his youngest son, who was called Henry. And he said, Henry, Henry, my boy, if you were a bird, what bird would you be and why? But Henry could not decide. And so he went away for a few days. Perhaps it was three. And here comes another train. So now it's going that way last time. This time it's going that way. Back to Norwich. Henry could not decide. And so he went away for three days and he pondered upon that problem. Before returning to his father and saying, Father, I cannot decide. And so perhaps I would be a starling. Or maybe I would be a swan. I would be a starling because it's a communal bird. It lives as one with all of the other starlings. Just as a good king, he should be at one with his people. And I would be a swan because it has a long curved neck, giving any words coming from its heart a long time to travel up its neck, giving the bird time to think about everything it says. Just as a good king, he should think about everything he says and everything he does. I should be a starling. Or maybe a swan. Well, I wonder. Who thinks that's a good answer? Quite a lot of you, I think. Well, it was time for the king to think. To make his decision. Before I tell you whom he chose, though, I think it's time for us all to pause and reflect for a short while. While I ask all of you, if you were a bird, what bird would you be? And why? Now, some of you, I know, are thinking that you would be owls, for owls are wise birds. But know this, they were all co so considered a, a portent of doom in medieval times. Some of you, perhaps, are thinking you would be skylarks, singing sweet, sweet songs, bringing joy and cheer to other people in these strange and unhappy times. That's all well and good, unless you've got a fear of heights like me. Now, looking at some of you, I think that you would like to be peacocks. But the best said about that, or is it the less said about that, the better? Yeah. Some of you might like to be robins. I'd like to be a robin too, you know. Pretty birds to be sure, but also cocky little buggers to boot. I would be a robin. Whatever bird you choose, I'm sure your answers are wise. Alas, the old king, he was not as wise as all of you. For many of you are hoping, expecting that he would have picked his youngest son, Henry. But he did not. Instead, he chose the middle son, William Rufus. William the Red, known for his fiery red hair and fiery red temper. For some of you probably already know, the old king, the sick king, was none other than William the Conqueror. Originally, Duke William of Normandy but now William I of this land, England, for he too had a fiery red temper. He chose his second son, and know that when at last the conqueror died, William the Rufus, or William II of this land, he was true to his word, for he ruled England like the eagle. He was feared by all of his people. He stripped the church of its wealth long before Henry VIII ever did. He harshened his father's already harsh forest laws. So if the likes of you and I, the common sort, the poorer folk, were caught hunting simply to fill our beddies, to feed our families, we might lose a hand, an eye. We might even be hung by the neck until we were dead. So cruel was William Rufus that his few friends warned him to be on his guard, for there were many who wished him harm. But William didn't listen. He didn't even listen to what was going on inside his own head. For although he was happy by day, at night, while he sleep, it was haunted by nightmares. And once it was on the eve of a hunt in a new forest down near the south coast of England. He dreamt he was being bled by his surgeon, 
that the doctor had taken a sharp knife, had nicked the vein, and now was letting a little bit of blood drip, 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 drip into a bowl held beneath for the purpose. But in the dream, the blood would not stop dripping. Instead, it got faster and faster and faster until it filled the bowl, until it spilt over the edges, until it filled William's dream, until it blotted out the setting sun. And the king, he woke with a start. He was terrified. So scared, he ordered that his servants hold candles aloft whilst he slept. But the following morning, light was bursting in through the window. And William Rufus was happy once more. He was riding out on the hunt and there was nothing he enjoyed more than that. Even better, his Fletcher, the man who had made his arrows, had made him a new quiver full of them. The finest arrows anyone had ever seen. Peacock feather fletchings, the works. Everyone who looked at them went, Ooh, ah. And you know what? They even went, wow. All of the courtiers wanted some of those arrows to go hunting with. But William Rufus wasn't about to share them with everyone. Instead, he gave half of them to his best friend, a young nobleman called Walter Terrell. For it was said of Terrell that he was the finest shot with a bow before the time of Robin Hood. And so it was that now they rode out on the hunt. Well, it seemed to William Rufus, William II of England, that already he was falling on Dame Fortune's wheel. For the hunting was poor that day. Not one deer, not one boar, not even a hare broke cover. And so over the course of the day's hunting, William and his courtiers, they spread out. And now as the sun began to set, William Rufus, his friend Walter Terrell, they found themselves separated from the rest of the group. They found themselves looking down a long avenue of trees that pointed west towards the setting sun. And so the two men decided they would wait on either side of the avenue, hidden amongst the ferns and bracken, to see what they might see. And as the sun was at its lowest, it was at its brightest. Both men set down their bows to shade and shelter their eyes. But as they did, they heard a crashing and a thrashing behind them. And now a great white stag broke cover. It ran between the two men. It ran west towards the setting sun. Without care, King William Rufus, he fitted arrow to bow. He leant, he aimed, he loosed the arrow. It spun, it twirled, it hummed. But now it simply skittered off the tough hide of the tough beast. Shoot, Walter, he called. Shoot now. Walter Terrell, with more care than the king, he fitted arrow to bow, he leant, he aimed, he loosed. The arrow, it flew through the air, it flashed, it shot, it hummed, it struck its target, it found its mark. But know that the great white stag kept running, for the arrow was sticking from the chest of the king. Terrell claimed it was an accident, yet still he mounted his horse, he rode to the nearest port, he sailed to his estates in France, never to return to this land. Even the king's younger brother, Henry, who'd been on the hunt, he didn't help William. Instead, with his own men, he rode to Winchester, where he claimed the crown of England for his own. Such was the hatred for William Rufus, William II of this land, that none helped him. His body was left in the greenwood for, I would like to say, three days until two charcoal burners. Some of you expecting it would be three. It should have been three, but one, well, he was self-isolating for some reason. Two, they took up the body. They put it on a rickety cart. They took it to Winchester, where it was buried without prayer, without care. Such was the hatred for the king. Well, as you've heard already, his younger brother, Henry, who wished to rule as the starling or the swan, he became the next king of England. And he was a good king in many ways, for he started that process of uniting Normans and Saxons. Although there were some who whispered it was him who had paid Walter Tyrrell to kill his own brother. Although others said, no, no, it was no mortal hand that killed the king. Instead, it was the spirits of the greenwood. 
it was Hearn the Hunter. It was the Green Man. And that William Rufus had been a blood sacrifice to ensure that the woodlands of England remain forever green. And you know, my friends, as I finish that story, I look around my garden and I see the boughs coming into leaf. I see blossom. There is the beginning of that green. It reminds me that the year, it too, turns in a circle. That soon summer will be here once more. A little bit of hope then. Yet more light. Just a chink of light in these dark times. On that thought, it's time for another story. And since we've been dealing with noblemen and kings, it's only right and balanced that we deal with the common sort, the poorer sort, the horny-handed sons and daughters of toil, the likes of you and me. Because they talked of three estates long ago, in medieval times. There were those who fought, the noblemen and kings. There were those who prayed. From the richly gowned bishops, monks, nuns, friars even, to poorly fed parish priests. And finally there were those who worked, the likes of you and me, people who broke their backs upon the land. Now I should today really include all of those people working hard in hospitals, shops and so much more. But long ago it was others who broke their backs upon the land. For know this, they too rode high upon fortune's wheel, but often they too fell. But there was once a girl, a girl who looked just like you. Except she didn't idle her days away at the storytelling cafe, for she was too busy working, working on her father's few meagre strips of land. And that girl had to work hard. She worked from dawn when the sun comes up to dusk when the moon takes over. And now it was dusk. The moon was casting strange shadows across the land, and so she made ready to leave the fields. But as she did, a mist began to form around her feet that began to boil and bubble, bubble and boil. It began to rise up and take the shape of a man. But not just any man, for it began to take the shape of a monk. Once a man of prayer, once a man of care, once a man of joy and song, but no longer. For he was dead. He was a ghostly monk, a monk who was a ghost. In one hand he held a great iron key, and with the other he beckoned her forward, saying, Come, girl, come, follow me, for I shall lead you to great treasure. Now I wonder, would you have followed him? Perhaps not. But the girl in my story, she was poor. She was hungry, and so she was lured on by the promise of great wealth. She followed him into the darkness. She followed him into the night. Well, they walked and they walked and they walked and they walked. They walked and they walked and they walked, for it was a long way. And as they walked, thorn and thistle tore at the skirts of the girl, bit into the flesh of her bare legs. But neither thorn nor thistle touched the gown of the ghostly monk as he hovered above the surface of the land. Well, they walked and they walked and they walked until finally they came to a wide but shallow stream. And the girl, she was forced to hitch up her clothes and tread carefully across, lest she fall in the icy stream and soak herself. But the ghostly monk, the monk who was a ghost, he simply hovered above the surface of the stream. And so it was, they continued walking until at last they came to the ruins of a priory. Once a place where monks had lived, once a place of prayer, once a place of care, once a place of joy and song. But no longer, for it was in ruins, destroyed by a greedy king, an horrible king with fiery red hair and a fiery red temper to match. The ghostly monk, the monk who was a ghost, he led the girl across the priory ground until they got to some low trees. And through the low trees was set a great stone wall. Set within the stone wall was a large wooden door. Set within the wooden door was a large iron lock. The ghostly monk, the monk who was a ghost, he took the iron key from his belt. He placed it in the lock. He turned it. There was a clunk. There's now... The door creaked open. 
Now, at this point, I'm going to let you all into a little secret. It's a guilty, terrible secret of mine. You must promise to tell no one else, do you swear? They know this. Although I've been telling stories for many years now, I've never perfected the art of the creaky door. Don't laugh, it's a terrible affliction for a storyteller. So you lot are going to have to do a creaky door for me. After three, one, two, three. Keep going, it's a big door. It's a very big door. That's what we call in Norfolk, a right old huge door hit it. The door creaked open. And you know what, this minute, I like to picture all of you, wherever you are, in front of your screens, all of you going, eh -eh -eh. while others who aren't looking at me, they're looking at you going, like that. The door creaked open. And even though it was still dark without... The girl could make something shining, glittering within. She walked into the chamber and she could see treasure. There was gold, there was silver, there were jewels, diamonds, rubies and emeralds. The monk followed into the chamber. He placed the iron key upon a bench and he spoke these words. He said, Take whatever you will, but remember, child, you must take that which is best. Be sure to take that which is best. That which is best, thought the girl. I do not know that which is best. But I do not think there's anything better than silver coins. And so, having no sack, she lifted up the front of her coarse homespun gown and she began to rake the silver coins in. And as she did, she began to dream of how she would spend them upon her grandfather. She thought, with these silver coins, I shall buy the old man a bed. No longer shall he lie upon the hard earth floor. He shall have a soft feather mattress on top of a carved oaken bed. And as she dreamt her dreams of carved oak beds, she continued to rake the silver coins in. And as she did... The ghostly monk, the monk who was a ghost, he spoke again. He said, take whatever you will, but remember, girl, you must take that which is best. Be sure to take that which is best. And at this point, I'd like to say two things. Sorry for the helicopter and know this, that monk had issues. The girl thought, I do not know what that noise is. I do not know that which is best. But I do not think there can be anything better than gold coins. And so she began to rake the gold coins into her dress. And as she did, she began to dream of how she would spend them upon her father. She thought, with these gold coins, I shall buy my father meat. No longer shall he eat a pottage, a thin soup of pea and bean. He shall eat venison. No longer shall he drink weak beer, small beer. From now on he shall drink wine, sack wine, flavoured with sugar and honey. And as she dreamt her dreams of sack wine, she continued to rake the gold coins in. But as she did, the ghostly monk, the monk who was a ghost, he spoke again. He said, take whatever you will, girl, but remember this. You must take that which is best. Be sure to take that which is best. Are you scared? No, I am. That which is best, thought the girl. I do not know that which is best. But I do not think there can be anything better than jewels, than diamonds, rubies and emeralds. And so, lifting up the front of her coarse woolen gown again, she, she raked the diamonds, the rubies, the emeralds in. And as she did, she began to dream of how she would spend them upon her mother. She thought, with these jewels, I shall buy my mother a new dress. I shall buy her 100 new dresses. I shall buy her 1,000 new dresses. No longer shall she wear a coarse gown. She shall wear silk. Silk that has been stitched with threads of silver and gold. And as she dreamt her dreams of threads of silver and gold, she continued to rake the jewels in. 
But as she did, the ghostly monk, the monk who was a ghost, he spoke again, he said, Take whatever you will, but remember, child, you must take that which is best. Be sure to take that which is best. But now the girl's dress was full. And so it was, with her dress full of treasure, a head full of dreams, slowly she staggered out of the chamber. But no sooner did she walk with that, than the treasure, it disappeared. No sooner did she walk into the moonlight, than so too the monk and the wooden door were gone. Because she had not taken that which was best, she had left the best behind. No, my friends, as well as being a story, this is also a riddle. And I wonder here if any of you this day can guess that which was best, that which she should have taken but did not. Some of you, I think, are saying, hmm, sapphires, yeah, he didn't mention sapphires. She didn't take the sapphires. But no, there were never any sapphires in the first place. Some of you are saying, oh, yeah, she should have taken the monk. But how could she? Come on, a ghostly monk. She couldn't carry him piggyback, could you? It's impossible to carry a ghost. Harder even than it is to steal steam. Some of you might be thinking that she left her good nature, her good character behind because she got too avaricious, greedy, taking too much gold. Now others are thinking, oh, that's a good answer. Oh, I like that. That's a clever answer, that is. But you know what? You're being too clever. The answer's much simpler than that. For the key to this riddle is very simple indeed. It was the great iron key. But had she taken that old iron key, she could have gone back to that chamber again and again and again. And so, my friends, I've given that story to all of you to take away. And the next time you write for supplies, whether it's to the supermarket, to the, to the local shop, keep that story with you. And if you are tempted to put more things in your basket than you really need, Think upon that story and remember this. Do not be blinded by your greed. A thoughtful tale. Can't argue with that, can you? We've done serious, thoughtful. It's time we got a bit irreverent. I do like an irreverent tale. And that last story, it took us out of the world of those who work. To the monk, of course. To those who pray. From those richly gowned bishops to the poorly fed parish priests. But this is a story about a friar. Now, for those who do not know, a friar is much like a monk, except they were mendicants, which meant they wandered the land, preaching and praying to all who would listen. And know that they too rode upon Dame Fortune's wheel. Sometimes they rose, but often they too fell. For know this. There was once a friar who was as big in the middle as he was tall. He was a man who was supposed to follow God in heaven above, although he was far more interested in following his belly. Like me, he liked to eat, and so he was a large and lovely man. This friar was so big that if I was to take the gown he wore, stitch up the armholes, stitch up the neck and use it as a sack, I could put you you, you, even you inside, and there'd still be room for me. He was an ample man. Well, he was a grey friar, and he was on a journey with a, a thinner brother of his order, a man who got all the nourishment he needed from God, and in truth, he was just a bit dull for all that. They had been walking all day. Their feet were sore, their bellies were empty, and so they sought shelter at the house of a butcher and his wife. They knocked hard upon the door. The butcher was not there, but his wife was. And she was a pious woman. She believed that to be close to a friar was to be close to God in heaven above. And so gladly she beckoned them within, into her kitchen. Picture the room, if you will. On one side a pantry, on the other a parlour, at the far end a fire. Next to the fire was a door. Beyond the door was a wooden staircase that curved up and around to one chamber above, the bedchamber of the butcher and his wife. Although this night it would be the bedchamber of the two friars. For being a pious good woman, 
She wasn't about to let them sleep in that cold, drafty barn. The two friars, they thought that they were riding truly high upon Dame Fortune's wheel. For this bedroom, it had a soft feather mattress, much nicer than the coarse uh, straw pallets that they were forced normally to sleep on. Very soon the fin fry was laying asleep, dreaming, dreaming of sitting on the right-hand side of God and other religious stuff like that. But the large friar, the ample man, he had noticed that all that, all that separated the chamber above from the kitchen below were thin wooden boards, badly joined. And now he desired to hear the talk betwixt husband and wife, and if he was lucky, perhaps even more. And so it was, he set his ears to the boards, and he listened, and he listened, and he listened. Well, it was now that the butcher returned home. Know that he was a completely different cut of meat to his wife, for he had no time for religion. He was more concerned with putting food on the table than he was worrying about heaven or hell. He had a particular dislike for friars. And so he called the two pigs he kept in his sty outside his fat grey friars. Although whenever he did so, his wife would scold him, warning him that no good would come of his impious words. She would say, you husband will have the wrath of God upon you if you're not careful. Although he never listened. Well coming back this night. Having no knowledge of the two men of God upstairs, he began to talk to his wife of the following day's business. He said, wife, wife, I have noticed that our two friars are very fat indeed, and so on the morning we shall rise early, we shall slit their throats, we shall salt their flesh, we shall sell it at market, and now he laughed loudly although his wife did not, warning him again that no good would come of his impious words. Meanwhile, the large friar upstairs, he did not laugh, but hearing the butcher speak and believing him to talk of his own terrible fate, he leapt upon the bed, he told the thin friar all that he had heard. The thin friar, he too, began to wail and moan, for although he was not scared of dying, he was not yet ready to leave this life. But what could they do? They could not go down the stairs and through the kitchen, for already they could hear the butcher down there sharpening his biggest, meanest knife. We shall have the wrist that dropped from the window, said the thin friar. After all, it will be no worse than falling upon the butcher's biggest, meanest knife. He went first. He lowered himself gently out of the window, dropping to the ground. And because he was so slight a frame, he landed softly. But now he was gone. He legged it. So much for being a brother. The fat friar, seeing that he'd been left to his fate, he leapt without prayer, without care from the window. He lied with a great crack and much swearing besides, for he had broken his leg. To make matters worse, the butcher's dog was beginning to bark. Well, he could scarce walk, let alone run, and so he crawled to the only hiding place nearby. The butcher's pigsty. And once inside, he clasped his hands together and he prayed for deliverance. Well, no, my friends, that night no deliverance came. And the following morning early, the butcher and his wife were up early. She cooking breakfast. He putting the finishing touches to sharpening that biggest, meanest knife. It was so sharp that day that you could draw blood from the very wind itself. Never had a knife been as sharp as this. Wrapping it in a leather sheath, he said, Wife, wife, it's time we see to slaughtering our fat grey friars. Again he laughed. He went, ah, <laughs> But that's how they laughed in medieval times. His wife, though, did not laugh. Again she said, Husband, you should be more careful. Speak like that and you will have the wrath of God upon you. But he did not listen. He walked out of the house, up the garden path to the pigsties, and now he called out, Come out, come out, Master Grey Friars, for it is my fixed intent this very day to taste your chitlins. 
But it wasn't pigs that came out of the sty that day. It was a real grey friar on his hands and knees, tears running down his already tear-stained face. He called out, Please don't slit my throat. Please don't salt my flesh and, and sell it at market. But the butcher did not reply. For the butcher was no longer there. For if that friar was in fear of his life, the butcher was in no less. For seeing what he'd seen, it seemed that his wife had been right all along. He did indeed have the wrath of God upon him. And so he ran and he ran and he ran. Now some will tell you that he ran until his feet were but bloody stumps and he fell over. Others say he ran to the nearest priory. He became a monk and spent the rest of his life in prayer, praying for his eternal soul. But there are some, just some who say, that after a while he stopped running. He realised his mistake, but he felt so foolish he wouldn't go home. Instead, he went to sea, became a sailor. He sailed the many seas, and it was he who was responsible for introducing the sausage to Germany. Three endings to that story, my friends. Pick the one that pleases you most. Well, I hope you enjoyed that tale. I hope you enjoyed it so much that you're thinking now you might like to put some of your spare coin in the virtual hats just below. They're just, uh, yeah, just down there. There's my hat, but there's also all of the other storytellers and some of the people who are helping out at the World Storytelling Cafe as well. Be generous if you can. Which brings me neatly to my last story, for it's a tale about a man who would have not put any money in a virtual hat. No hat come to that. For let's just say for him, the wheel of fortune had stopped spinning. He was dead. Now in life, he'd been a merchant, but also a miser. Someone who had kept all that was his for himself. If you had come begging at his door for some toilet roll, for some bum wipe or other goods, he would have gone, get ye gone, tarry here no more, be off with you. He would have sent you away with no but a boot up your backside. But then he was dying. And as he lay upon his deathbed, as his life grew less and less, his fear of punishment in hell, it grew more and more. And so it was he had drawn his family to him. And he said, family, for the good of my soul in heaven, when I die on the, on the day of my funeral, you must give a penny to every poor man who asks it of you, in the hope that they will pray for my soul. But, said the miser, but, says he, you must only give a penny to honest men, those who tell the truth. Those who tell lies, says he, they shall have nothing. And then he died. He went, up oh, like that. Well, on the day of the miser's funeral, a great crowd of poor folk gathered outside his house. They were shown in to speak to his family, one by one by one. The first man walked in, a ragged man. Head low, he spoke in hushed tones. He said, God is good. And the family said, you speak the truth. God is good. You shall have a penny. They sent him away with a shiny coin. Well, then another man walked in, again, in torn and ragged garb, but with his head held high, and he said, the devil is good. And they said, oh, no, 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 the devil is bad. You tell a lie, you shall have nothing. And they sent him away with no but a boot up his backside. Well, then a third man walked into the room with his head held neither high nor low. But you know what? His eyes shone, especially against his dull attire. He was what was known long ago as a coney-catching cunning man, a beguiler of the foolish. For this is what he said. Ne'er a penny shall you give me. You shall never, ever, ever give me a penny. And so the family couldn't decide whether they should give him a penny or no. Think about it, my friends. Those who tell the truth get a shiny silver coin. Those who tell a lie get nothing. And he said, you shall never ever give me a penny.
And so I finished my set with another riddle. I'll tell you this, it's going to keep some of you up all night. But in, if on the off chance, some of you out there, one or two of you, you are able to solve that puzzle. If when this madness is over, if in a time when we can roam free again, you want to let me know. Come here to Ivy Cottage in the wilds of Norfolk, not that far from Norwich, and tell me. Because I haven't got a clue what the answer is. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just been listening to the most magnificent storyteller. And just like if you come into a pub or a bar if you happen to be in America. And they haven't, there's no door charge. But there's a tip jar. Or there's a hat. We'd really appreciate it. Because that tell us, you know, they've got no way to earn at the moment. We'd really appreciate it. If you could reach into your pocket. And you could drop a little something into the hat. Thank you. And to do that, you have to go to the website. World Storytelling Cafe.